Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 39. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. First of all, a thank you to all of you for supporting us thus far. Do please take a look at our website and you'll see different membership options, uh, a bronze, a silver and a gold, and you'll see they all come with uh, different levels of interaction and input. But anything you can do, any help you can offer us is hugely appreciated. And I hope you'll see over the coming weeks the improvement that it allows us to make. First of all, we're going to be um, improving our website, which is coming soon, and there'll be a new members area. So we'll keep you posted about all new developments. And do please, if you haven't already, go to the bottom of our homepage on www.catholicunscripted.com and join our mailing list where we'll keep you updated through some newsletters there. Thank you very much. So it's been a busy weekend for both of you. Mark, you were at uh, the Catholic Men UK conference and were speaking there and can tell us a bit more about that. And Gavin, you've just returned from Copenhagen where you gave a talk about C.S. Lewis and we're looking forward to hearing about that. So perhaps if we begin... Mark, with you, tell us about the Catholic Man UK. Uh, so, well, so there's a sort of an apostolate that's been set up to, I think, because there's a great need um, to help a lot of young men who seem increasingly seem quite lost in lots of lots of different ways. Um, so it's a great idea to get young men together. Well, and you know, there's quite a broad age range of men actually, so um, which was really nice. Uh, and to talk about what's important, I, I suppose it's an attempt to diffuse this toxic masculinity narrative um, by so, by affirming um, the importance of father, like fatherhood is a really big dimension of it. So there's a lot of talk about um, rites of passage, uh, how you transition from being a boy. That was my talk was about transitioning from boyhood to manhood, um, trying to link that obviously very strongly to our faith the duties, the way that um, the Bible talks about fatherhood, the way that Catholicism talks about fatherhood um, in really positive, affirming ways. Um, so it was a really, it was really a joyful sort of conference. There was, we were in Buckton Towers, which is, you know, this old Tudor building. In fact, Dr. David Starkey turned up on the Saturday, was just wandering around with some people. So that was quite interesting. Um, and I was really impressed with the quality of the attendees. They were, when you, when you go to something like that, you don't really know. I didn't get much of a steer as to who I would be, what level of formation you're speaking to. So you're always a bit worried about where you're going to pitch it, aren't you? You know, if you're going to a university, then you're pitching it on one level. And if you're speaking to um, a men's group in a, in a local parish, then you're going to pitch it at a different level. Um, but I found that they were very well formed um, and really knew their stuff and were very, very engaged. So that was, you know, it was really good. And it meant that there was robust discussion, good questions, um, and that we took place in part in various panels. Um, and some of the questions were really good. There was a lot of talk of women, a lot of, like, which was really wonderful, you know, a lot of talk about how we are better fathers to our daughters and how we are better husbands to our wives. So I thought that was a really interesting dimension. Obviously, there was all the, the like the four P's is one of the main things of Catholic Man UK, procreation, primacy, provision and protection. Um, so di discussing those things around those themes. Uh, Dr. Jacob Phillips was there as well, which was really good. He, he gave a talk on dominion and a lot of the information was surrounding statistics or statistical research on the effect that fathers have in society or their absence you know obviously has a detrimental effect on society and how that has been researched sociologically and mm. so which was really encouraging i think for all the guys there because it, it shows you that again contrary to the to the mainstream secular culture which seems to be erasing men from culture and mm. i couldn't help but think about some of the conversations we've had about disney and you know like these um the big media outlets at the moment where um if you i don't know i'm sure gavin you don't follow what's going on at disney or marvel but <laughs> these are big things for the young guys mm. obviously coming through and they've just basically done away with all the male heroes and they've just all the superheroes now are all women 
you know, strong women who can do everything, and all the men are sort of just lame duck, goofy sidekick sort of thing. Um, and they're like, crashing, you know. Like you and me in unscripted, work. you mean? Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. So, you know, that was, it was really, really interesting. And a lot of, um, a lot of the, the content in his talk was about affirming the importance of, uh, you know, male figures for play, you know, playing mm. with their children and the effect that they have in the family and those sort of regards. It was really absolutely brilliant. So really, really good. There was uh, the, the, the chaplain is one of the Norbertines um, from South London. Father Pius Collins, who's you know was really wonderful, very insightful, had great mm -hmm. advice for everyone, and mm -hmm. we had beautiful liturgy all weekend. Um, big fire on Saturday night, and you know some beers, so uh, and singing you know the Salve Regina sort of. I thought you Melbourne. put that on on Twitter. It was lovely to see. Yeah, it's lovely to hear you talk about the transition from boyhood to manhood, rather than the transition from boyhood to womanhood. Uh, which we hear m more of than we should. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, so, so these, so you spoke about rites of passage, and that's definitely something we've lost in our culture, isn't it? This idea that that there is, you have to notice that a boy is created differently to a girl, and needs to become a man, and needs to transition, and these these importance of these things. What rites of passage do you think have been lost over time that has left our young men so flailing around and unable to recognize their identity as a young man and what needs to be um put in place or remembered or participated in so that they can again once again recognize their identity and fulfill their potential as a man both of you i wonder i wonder if um a lot of it i've recognized over my years is to do with the health and safety culture in a lot of respects that's so, you know, when I was a scout, you used to wear a big sheath knife on your belt and, um, you know, spend weekends ch chopping up things and making furniture out of pallets and whatever. And I think that um, a lot of those things are, are sort of out of bounds now. Um, but certainly it, it seemed to be a lot more adventurous. We were just let loose on our own at 14, mm -hmm. traipsing around the countryside with a tent. That's, so that, they're my experiences of that rites of passage. In the conference, there was a lot of talk of linking this to the sacraments. So mm. particularly, obviously, mm. the obvious one is is confirmation. And from a from a catechetical point of view, that's not really what confirmation is is about. And certainly, there's a lot of argument among catechists that we should have, like at the moment, it's about fourteen, fifteen. But there's a lot of argument that it should actually be before First Holy Communion because, you, you know, what we want is for young people to come to the Blessed Sacrament in full awareness of what it is that they're doing. And obviously it used to be before and they changed it to afterwards. So there's a lot of discussion around that. But given the fact that it is in most countries at 14 or 15, um, it's up to obviously individual families and whatever, but it would that is one opportunity where you could turn that into a kind of a, a rite of passage for young men. For my children, I, you know, we did things like we, you know, we canoed out to one of the islands in Clue Bay once and built a massive fire and, you know, so going on adventures. And also one of the other things that I was talking about was Catholic adventures. We used to go, if there's a cardinal in London, then we'd get the train into London and go to mass or, you know, visit somewhere like a shrine or something like that. And, you know, it gives you the opportunity to have those conversations and to introduce them to uh, their role as a Catholic in the wider world uh, and how that, how, you know, to talk about the way that we it affects the wider world. So similarly, March for Life, I would say, is a right, you know, going on the March for Life and seeing how faith, you know, it's efficacious in the culture if you're going out and it, the way where it contrasts and, where the decisions that you make stand against that culture. Um, and another one, there's a brilliant one, the Rosary Crusade in October. We've done that with the kids as well, uh, where we they march from Westminster Cathedral to Brompton Oratory and then have like a, some liturgy there. So, so you know, there are some of the ideas that, that we've talked about. And in the conference, it was much more about the fact that we've got, I mean, some of the statistics that Dr. Phillips came out with about young men, how many hours they'd spent, like literally years 
playing the Xbox. You know, if you added up all the hours they were playing the, um, console games. So now instead of reading or, you know, interacting with anyone, and like one of the scary statistics was that uh, there's a lot less sex, you know, like kids are at, like that young people aren't as sexually active um, as well. Perhaps they are sexually active, but not with each other, you know, and that it was like, it's not because of chastity. Um, it's because they're, because of pornography, unfortunately, yeah. you know, is, is sort of having a massive effect. And then that means that they can't form relationships. Mm -hmm. And even with the young men who were at the conference, there was a lot of talk of how do I talk to a woman? How do I find a woman? You know, how do I, which was, you know, quite interesting from our point, from our sort of age group, isn't it? Because you you went out and, and spoke to them. <laughs> That's the only way there was to do it before the internet, I suppose, wasn't it? Everything is internet, everything now, when you talk to the, to young people, isn't it? It's all about the internet. And it's well worth um, looking at the published literature on the effects of pornography, not just from those who have concerns from a religious perspective, but just from how it destroys, it just destroys the human person. It just, it, it completely alienates you from your very nature and you no longer understand how you function. And then as a consequence of that, then we you talk about health and safety, then you have to have very artificial boundaries around the interaction between men and women to try and guard, to protect them, to, to create safety for them because they've been so, you know, the pornography has so addled their sense of how to interact in a natural way. And so one terrible thing creates another unnatural thing, which has a knock on effect. And I feel so sorry for young men. You know, Mark, you and I have got young sons. Gavin, your son is a man now and a very great credit to you. But um, it's it's definitely uh, a worry. Although I say that, Mark, your your boys are also a bit older. Um, but but yes, we and, and, and the other thing is male only spaces, because scouts, I think, now have to take girls um because it's equality you know equality demands it so it's very hard to find male only spaces with your son I, I must say another shout out to opus day who have a great few clubs um they're very good at, at having young like clubs for young men and clubs for young women and they, they they just have great fun at these clubs so do look into that and seek those out if there's any in your area they're very good so gavin um on that this this idea of of young men not knowing what it is to be a man. This is such an enormous subject. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you talked about pornography. I think one of the worst things, so I think one of the worst things that pornography does is it gives men an entirely false view of, of what womanhood is and who women are. And the reason that matters in particular is because for, for many of us, women are very mysterious. We're not, we're not very good at, they, they work really quite differently from us. And that's hard enough as it is, but if you throw in the pornography fantasies, then it makes it almost impossible for men to have a real relationship as human beings with, if you like, the, the biological other. So I, I, I think that one of the things pornography does is it saps, it, it saps the confidence of men and, and pollutes the whole of their worldview in an, a really terrifying way. And I don't think we can overestimate the damage that's done. Interestingly enough, um, if I can let this segue into my, my weekend in Copenhagen because uh, I gave a lecture on C.S. Lewis and then I, I, it was a long lecture and then questions lasted for an hour and that was long. And then we went and sat on outside a cafe in the street and talked. And the really interesting thing was over beers and with a smaller group, we talked about sex again. And the uh, partly because there were some, some students there who'd been doing philosophy and they were <laughs> they thought I might be bigoted. And misogynist and they really wanted to give me a, a rough time over the alphabet people and over sexuality because of course the whole thing is connected and one of the things you know every, every time one discusses this it kind of clicks clearer in your in your own head um but one of the things that became clear to me was the way in which the whole of biological experience and creation is slanted towards the feminine in other words if, if you take out the experience of of jesus and the jews um and you just say, well, here we are on planet Earth. The Earth is quite clearly feminine in, in the way she feeds us, she nurtures us, she gives life. If you project from our natural biological experience and things, men and women are not symmetrically opposite. We're just too, com it's, it's not like women are the opposite of men and men are the opposite. We're two completely different versions of being human. 
uh, and our biological experience doesn't match each other's. They're, they're entirely complementary. It only makes sense when we become a whole, if you like. Um, but you can't kind of match us symmetrically and, and say, well, here's the male way, there's, there's the women's way. It's much more complicated than that. And, and as you talk through natural theology and all the fertility cults, it, the conclusion we ought to come to is that calling God Father is really aberrational. It's 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 not to be expected at all. Um, and it was only the experience of the Jews being told by God that he was who he was. And Jesus then saying the intimacy is one of a father relationship, that some form of balance was set up. And in a strange way, what people don't understand, because they think it's misogyny and a power, a power trick from the masculine side, the Catholic Church and Christianity is trying to establish some kind of very delicate balance between men and women. And the moment you begin to take away the revelation of God as Father, and there's another reason why Mary is so enormously important, uh, <laughs> you, you, you throw the whole thing badly out of balance. And we found ourselves talking about the way in which, really, particularly because many of my, my friends there were Protestant, only the Catholic Church, with her view of the the church as the bride of christ and our lady as theotokos can find the right balance and what we're doing at the moment with the whole progressive agenda of course is to throw it right out of balance again and this lack of balance has really discombobulated the protestants um the lack of balance between male and female the lack of the completely missing of mary and their inability i'm not blaming them because we're catholics are struggling with the same thing but their inability to manage the progressive agenda has means that they, they that they've been diluted and destabilized as a Christian force, and essentially we were talking about whether or not C.S. Lewis would become a Catholic at the end of it. I'm quite convinced he would because I mean one of the things his <laughs> chaplain said, um, Walter Hooper, who also became a Catholic, was Lewis said if this modernity thing continues, Christians will be left between the choice of being atheists or Catholics. Well, if you're not going to be an atheist, then Catholic is the only thing that's left. And I think the reason this matters is because we have to have much more confidence of Catholics that we're, we're holding the ring at the very end of our civilization. Um, and, and at the same time, that, that um, everybody else has given way. And this civil war that we have in the Catholic Church at the moment, that unfortunately is being led by the Vatican, which is the worst possible place it could be led by. We could cope with, with progressive theologians so Abre doing it we can cope with idiot laity doing it we can't cope with it coming from the very top and that's why the wound is so absolutely dreadful that we're experiencing at the moment and and why the only response is to continue to re-articulate the faith that has been as St Paul said handed oh. on down to us and 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 not panic um but but not not panic at this dreadful wound that is destabilizing the Catholic faith Lewis saw it all coming and as we went through the things that he said, the way in which he prepared us for the issues we're facing today. Um, it was almost like he was a Catholic prophet. We saw that at the conference. There was a, during one of the discussions, uh, there was a question about evangelization. And basically the guy, like, it was amazing to see how many of the men there were, were able to articulate the fact that it's very difficult to evangelize in the current environment uh, where you, like basically you're saying to people, um, yes, the Catholic Church is the truth, and but it's a bit crap at the moment, sort of thing. You know? So uh, just don't worry about that. Ignore these bits of it. And um, and and the question to the panel was, how do you evangelise in the current culture? And the answer came back resoundingly and in conformity with each. You know, everyone was saying well, the, the truth is still the truth. You know, the faith is still the faith. It's a wonderful treasure. None of that has changed. You know, the politics might be a little bit difficult at the moment, but you still teach. You can still show the objective truth for the beautiful treasure that it is. And that hasn't changed at all. You know, there's yeah, always been idiots coming out with all this rubbish, you know, and that's the same now as it always was. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I think a lot of what you said is hugely important, Gavin, there about femininity and masculinity. And as you know, I think one of the greatest challenges that we face or rather what lies behind some of the greatest challenges we face is a, is a loss of understanding of the feminine is lost femininity and you say there mark we can still show 
our faith. And in some in some sense, I totally agree with you. Of course, we can demonstrate our faith. We can point people to. But what we there's a lot of what needs to be understood that cannot be shared, that is mysterious. And I think this is where the participatory comes in. Um, it goes back a little bit to this discussion raised by the uh, conversion of Ayana Hershey Ali to Christianity and a lot that's been written about her. And um, you can read all about that. There's a very good article by your um, the, uh, our friend and speaker at Catholic Man UK, Dr. Jacob Phillips as well, who's written brilliantly on that. But I think it's this loss of femininity and and our loss of ability to accept that there are things that are mysterious that we cannot demonstrate. And there's a frustration there. I think it's a very post-enlightenment frustration, uh, sort of post, uh, reformation frustration um, or deformation, as we might say. Uh, and I just I'm going to point to my own article just this coming month in the Catholic Herald about Tammy Peterson. And it's come out online today, but it will be in the magazine edition. And I put here, we rarely notice the loving sacrifice that goes into making the invisible visible. And so as a consequence, we celebrate only that which we can see. Uh, sorry, we celebrate only that which we can see, failing to appreciate that something can only be produced if it has space to grow, if it is nourished and nurtured to become. What we what we become is wonderful, but how we become is mysterious. With her sacramental worldview, it's no surprise Tammy is becoming a Catholic. Only a sacramental worldview can draw us into the mystery which marries heaven and earth, meaning and matter, body and soul, man and woman in perfect harmony. For it is in the blessed sacrament that the invisible God becomes visible. So I think you're you're quite right there. I think that we and when you talk about men being presented, men and women being presented with these new superhero role models in Disney films and um, Marvel. Um, and there are a lot of people who want to say, so what? Isn't it about time women ruled the show and, you know, were the superhero? They've been downtrodden for so long. I think they're missing the point completely. I think, first of all, it's insulting to women because what it does is it says exactly that. We recognise and value only that which we can see, only that which is demonstrable, but not which has, but not that which has given birth to that which we can see and that's what we really need to recognize and in a way the very fact of saying that we need to recognize it will will take it away uh, so i think instead we have to step into the mystery of our faith we have to live it and step into the mystery and accept that that mystery is something incredibly valuable that we may not be able to articulate but which is missing it's like a loss of femininity sorry going yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly okay, well, I was just going to say, it's, it's a loss of femininity, the kind of um, equality, if you want to call it that. It's not really, I don't see it as equality at all, because mm -hmm. all it is is women can now be men. That's that's, exactly. that's how it So they lose exactly. all the wonderful, amazing stuff that makes them feminine, and instead yeah. they adopt male personas and male attitudes. And so mm -hmm. the superhero thing is a great example of that, isn't it? Because you've all of a sudden got all these women who can beat up all the men and... You know, they're flying around and doing all the male stuff, all the protection, all the, yeah, yeah. you know, all of that kind of thing. Instead of, and it's like, it completely erases what's wonderful about womanhood, womanhood. about the, the extraordinary thing that men love about women, you know, and it just completely does away with that, which is a travesty, really, not, yeah, as far as I can see. A total insult to women. And and it, again, it says to them, this is what, this, by the way, is, the only way in which you'll be celebrated when you emulate a man. It was mm. Alice von Hildebrand, who I love and must have mentioned about four billion times on this podcast. Um, check her out if you haven't already. And her husband, Dietrich, um, who said Feminiz feminism is the death of femininity. I couldn't agree more. Feminism is the death of femininity. Think about that. Wrap our heads around that, because that if we can get that, then maybe we ha are sort of on our way to reordering our completely messed up and incoherent world sorry gavin you were you were about to say something um i was about to say that that, that in terms of evangelism one of the things that we can do is to talk about the strengths of catholicism it's often easier for somebody who's coming from the outside to see what they are but 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 they begin for example by by saying there is no war between men and women within the church I mean, the people are bringing in the war of course are the feminists who want who, who are stirring the war up and the conflict as they try and uh, seek 
power uh, through the priesthood. But but within the Catholic Church, there is no war. There is a there's a, a great sense of the difference of roles, and, and particularly over the way in which we understand sex and families. Sex and families are the battleground in which everything is being fought over in secular world, and it's profoundly disturbing and disorientating. And, and essentially, they're simply they're they're both becoming degraded. Families are becoming degraded. Uh, the, the practice and the understanding of sex is becoming degraded. I, I was one of the things we were talking about was um, Lewis's great divorce, and there is an extraordinary uh, ele um, story in there, which is the one that sticks out for me most of all, where a man is dealing with lust and there's this lizard on his shoulder, um, and finally he finds the courage to ask the angel to break the lizard's neck, and the whispering of lust stops. Um, and I remember the first time I read it, that was all I remembered of the story. But Lewis goes on in a very brave, dangerous and profound way. He has the lizard, lizard writhing on the ground, not dead, but reconfigured and transformed. And it turns into a white stallion. And then the man who was in uh, enthralled to pornography climbs on the white stallion, which carries him to heaven. And one of the things Lewis was saying was he, was he was confronting Freud for a start, most importantly. But he was talking about the way in which that there is a a Christian capacity to sublimate sexual desire and to and to turn it into an, a form of of spiritualized energy, which of course is partly what celibus is based on, and the saints have been doing. In other words, Catholicism carries within it a way of non-degrading the things that are wrecking humanity at the moment, a different way of managing sexual desire, a different way of managing the way in which the sexes relate to each other, and and doing this doing the whole thing. Um, within the within the celebration of families, which of course are dying out, people aren't having children. I think if we can only stop talking about what's happening in the Vatican, uh, I mean, we, I mean, with but between ourselves, we have to talk about it because we have to repudiate that the the, the um, false sort of heresy. Yeah, false mm. heresy. I'm so I'm trying to find I'm trying to find non-aggressive words. We we have to repudiate the the mistakes that are coming from there because it, there it, it's become a launching pad for progressive and secular ideas but having done that we ought to be able to tell other people look within the church we have a different way of living we, we these these things that are causing you so much distress in your in your head and so much difficulty on the streets we have a different way of doing this and uh, the, for a while we've been saying the the more society suffers the more disorientated and disintegrated it becomes the greater a platform for evangelism we have because people throw up their hands and say, this, this really isn't working at all. Do you have a different way? And and not as Protestants, but as Catholics, we can say we really do have a different way. It's 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 quite magnificent. And look what it's produced. I wonder, just as a, I don't want to divert us back into politics, but um, there's loads coming out about the Strickland, about Strickland's removal. And it's really interesting to see the reaction which seems to be this could be a you know this could be a, a a lightning rod or this could be the moment where everything sort of turns around because you've got a pope who's constantly talking about dialogue and accompaniment and parousia and yet he he's doing um, he's taking unprecedented action that would leave you to believe that this is the worst bishop in the world you know um, removing him without any dialogue without any accompaniment without any justice. And at the same time, we've got absolute evidence that he is protecting bishops who cover up and abuse people. Um, and the inconsistency in that narrative, it, it's really been laid bare by this action in a way that lots and lots of people all of a sudden are saying, well, hang on a minute, this is, you know, this far and no further sort of thing. One, one of the things I'm trying to do is, as, uh, is to distinguish between the this and the person. And the fact is, we have very severe dysfunctionality from the person. The office is, is precious and needs to be defended. Um, it's, I don't think we need any more evidence about the dysfunctionality because um, it, it, you know, it's going to, it's going to pour nastiness uh, and, and discord into the church uh, without end. You only have to look at Strickland's face, actually. You know, if you just, you know, look at the man's face, listen to his voice, listen to him talk. Anybody with any discernment immediately knows this is a man who's been made a victim of completely improperly. So um, this is going to continue until until the present <laughs> incumbent dies. Everything depends upon in our prayers. I think that the Lord will give us a man where where the personality and the office are synchronized in a way that um, 
or bless the church instead of causing the damage it's done. So we just have to grin and bear it and get on our knees and pray. Pray that not too much damage is done, but I don't think we need to tell the world uh, all about it. I think we need to tell the world the beauty of the faith mm. and try, try and try and lock the dirty laundry away to we can manage to clean it <laughs> internally and domestically. Exactly. I think that's that's a really lovely message. And to take Pope Francis's own words, famous words, who am I to judge, goes back to what I just said there, you know, that it's, Mark turns his nose up. Um, <laughs> but 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 quite, re you know, but quite seriously, who, it, he may say, who am I to judge? And by implication, he means God will judge. So this, there, there's some disgraceful covering up um, injustices, persecutions, and God be their judge. It's not going to be us, but Goodness me, we have to pray, keep on our knees, as you say, and pray. Um, talking about injustices, I'd like to finish today, if we can, with a bit of conversation about the persecuted Christians around the world. Um, first of all, this Wednesday, uh, the 22nd of November, is Red Wednesday, which is a campaign that the Aid to the Church in Need began in 2016. And the idea is to where, you know, it sort of have read as a sign of the blood of the martyrs and it's to remind us of the great persecution that's going on around the world against christians and it coincides with a short video that father benedict keely shared with michael knowles this week which if you haven't seen it please do take the time it's 12 minutes long it's not long at all but it's a very powerful video and i'll link it here on this video so you can see and he's speaking about persecuted Christians. And uh, it's well worth visiting also his charitable organisation, which is Nazarene.org. I think it's .org or .com. I think it's .org. And it's with an S, not a Z, but I'll put that in the links. And Father Keeley, in, in this interview with uh, Michael Knowles, um, shares the following story. Uh, last year on the Feast of Pentecost in a diocese in Africa, Islamists burst into Sunday Mass and slaughtered more than 40 men, women and children. After this atrocity, the president of Ireland, Michael Higgins, wrote a letter of condolence in which he blamed global warming. Right. The bishop of the diocese replied to him saying, my people were not killed because of global warming. They were killed because they were Christians. You idiot. Father, he didn't say that, but Father, no. Father Benedict Keeley says, if we don't care about that in the West, especially if we claim the name of Christians, then there's something wrong with us. Um, Christians are the most persecuted religious group across the world. Uh, Father Benedict Keeley talks about how if if we were to compare Christians or religious groups to the sort of list that something like the World Wild Wildlife Fund has of endangered animals, Christians in Iraq would fit into the nearly extinct category. Um, they have been driven out of Iraq. And some people, he said, say to him, when did, when did Christians go and spread the gospel in Iraq? The disciples of Jesus brought the gospel to Iraq and then went out and brought the gospel to the rest of the world. And so this is these 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 Christian communities the, that have you know existed ancient Christian communities Beginning. are being persecuted. There's ethnic cleansing. I think the first genocide in 1915, the the first term genocide was used about the Armenian Christians who were <clears throat> completely wiped out or almost completely wiped out. And what's very interesting as well is that Adolf Hitler famously said when he was beginning his programme of um, persecution of the Jews, said, well, who remembers the Armenians? In other words, we can get away with this because people will forget about it. Um, and we are forgetting about it. We're forgetting about what's happened historically and we are not paying attention to what's happening now. And as Michael Knoll said as well, quite, quite sort of, amusingly but also devastatingly is that people care more about the sort of fish in california dying than they do about persecuted christians so our again yet again this idea of our wrong-headedness of the of the wrong order of things we've we've taken away the highest thing and replaced it with something else and then, and as we do so this horrible incoherence we've spoken about before so i just wanted to to sort of talk about this a little bit this uh, Red Wednesday campaign. And if you're not familiar, take a look at the Aid to the Church in Needs website and also Nazarene.org and look at that interview with Father Benedict Keeley. But I know you've, I think you've both seen that. What did you make of it, Mark? I thought, well, exactly as you say, I thought it was really powerful. And it's that, um, it's the way that the hierarchy of truths has been completely inverted by the woke culture. That's what 
uh, constantly strikes me about the, the civilization that, that we live in. And um, even on a day to day basis, you're engaged in conversations where you're like, you know, someone says something mm. and they're trying to score points. You know, they're trying to score points for being on the right side of an argument. It's like, no, that's not, you know, that's not that's not true. And that's not how things work. And it's really what we see going on um, with a lot of these discussions in our culture where we've lo we've lost the history, we've lost a real understanding of the history and we're being sold some different narrative, a false narrative now about like what's right and wrong, you know, what like what's happened in the past. And we've spoken before about like um, Islam in um, Andalusia, you know, which was yeah. as been portrayed, well, you know, like the, the role of Islam and one of the best ones I think is the Crusades, you know, where you've got, um, it, it's it's a, a drum that they beat to a, allow, and slavery was, it was on Radio 4 this morning again, you know, about um, slavery and the idea that basically white men are responsible for all the ills and poisons in the world and you end up having these conversations and, and there's, there's very little basis in reality, which yeah. is extremely yeah. you know frustrating and puzzling and so it was great to hear father keely he just cut through all of that with yeah. some you know because he knows the situation from a, an, an eyewitness perspective he's just able to cut through all of that with some really salient facts isn't he mm, he's he's uh he's visited iraq more than nine times and he's helped set up what they do is they they, they give these funds to help people to to set up and establish in their country to stay there to have hope that they can um not be driven out and to help them and i think it's a very powerful very powerful thing to do and actually what's awful is it's really our kids they're targeting as always with these things with the transgender the lgbt ideology it's our kids it's if you if you're a parent of a child in school today I'm sure this has got worse over time, although it's always been a bit like this. The kids come home and their school, you open their school bags and they've got letters about, you know, Meatless Monday, um, Black History Month, Wear Yellow Day, Vegetarian Society and, you know, Recycle Month. And it's it's no, there's nothing wrong with recycling. There's nothing wrong with any of these things as such, although Pride Month there is. Um, but. It's that then they're, they're sold to our kids as these are really, really important causes. And if you're if you're telling them, here's 20 important causes. Oh, and some Christians are being persecuted in Armenia. They just get bundled along a bit of a seamless garment notion as well, mm. along with recycling your boxes. And your, it, this is this is absolutely it, it sort of desensitizes them to the seriousness of what's happening and this ethnic cleansing. Of Christians, as as Father Keely said, if you're about to get your head chopped off, you're not too worried about global warming, you know. And we and we've got to say tough things like that because that's the reality. That's hard hitting, but it's what our young people need to hear. So as parents, I think we have to check what's coming in from our schools as well and say, how many causes are we going to? How are we going to help them discern between these quite empty, it's kind of meaningless piggybacking on popular causes um, compared mm. with it this absolutely atrocious information that we know about persecuted Christians. And we're hoping to um, uh, to offer ourselves to various Catholic schools in particular. And one of the mm -hmm. things, partly to refute uh, diversity, inclusion and equity narratives that are being given, but also because, as Mark was saying, uh, we live not so much in a post-truth society as an anti-truth society. Um, or if all, the, the, all the things we've been talking about have been anti-truth, completely different facts. And one of the things we have to do as best we can is to put the facts back on the table again so people can know what they are because the, they're being turned inside out. And of course, spiritually, this is, you know, the far, this is the campaign of the father of lies to take factual truth and present it as something entirely different, which people then swallow. It makes it immensely difficult then to have a conversation about discernment because in the end, we're, we're, you know, everyone says, I want the good. But if you have the wrong facts, then you end up, you may end up with, with good as evil and evil as good, which is, I think, is the fundamental philosophical and spiritual crisis of our time. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Another fabulous conversation. Thank you to all of you for watching. And do please visit our website, catholicunscripted.com, and scroll down to the bottom of the homepage and 
um, join the mailing list so that we can keep in touch with you. Thank you again. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. God bless you and keep you. And thank you for your support, as always.